Good evening. I'm Councilmember Carlos Flores and thank you for joining us today for our first District 2 Virtual Town Hall. I know this has been a really difficult time for our community and I wanted to take this opportunity to update you on some important topics. To start, this town hall is virtual so that we can practice social distancing and keep each other safe. Although we have multiple staff with us this evening, we are bringing each guest out one at a time so we can maintain six feet of distance. We're also wearing masks when we aren't talking. And I'll remove mine now. These are important steps that we are taking here in the studio and that each of you should be practicing as well. If we all do our part, we can reduce the number of infections and keep our communities as safe as possible. Our translators, unfortunately, are in isolation because of possible exposure to COVID-19. However, we will be adding Spanish subtitles to tonight's video and posting that online. However, Spanish speakers can call in with questions and I will be happy to translate. During tonight's meeting, we won't be talking about COVID-19 extensively. However, if you have questions or concerns about COVID-19, I encourage you to visit the city's website. We have information that is updated daily and we also have a hotline at 817-392-8478. Staff can answer your questions about restrictions, closings, testing, and the impact on city services. If you have any other questions during tonight's meeting, you can call 817-392-6014. Some residents submitted questions before tonight's event. We will answer as many questions as we have time this evening. If you don't get to your question, we will post the answer on the city and my Facebook pages. Tonight, our first guest is Deputy City Manager Jay Chapa. Jay has been with the city for more than 20 years and has worked in the Economic Development Department, the Finance Department, and the Housing and Economic Development Department. He was also an Assistant Director in the Water Department. Jay currently oversees Economic Development, Financial Management Services, Human Resources, Police and Public Events. So welcome, Jay. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. And one of the topics that I wanted you to address tonight is the city's budget and how the current COVID-19 restrictions have impacted our current and future budgets here in the city. Well, thank you, Councilman, for uh, inviting me here today and, and having me on. Uh, yeah, the COVID situation and the impact it's had on our economy, businesses closing is definitely having a, a negative impact on the city's overall budget for this year. And as we project forward to future years, uh, we're having to, to put some planning into place to be able to deal with that. Uh, the city has been uh, taking some measures because of a shortfall in primarily sales tax and also um, operations related to our public events department, which is our hotel tax and the running of the venues, the convention center, Will Rogers, those places. <clears throat> All that business dried up uh, with the closing of the state and not being able to have large gatherings. So. Uh, we did put some measures into place like a hiring freeze. Uh, so currently the city has over 350 uh, vacancies that, that we are not filling in order to save money there. Uh, we also put a slowdown on some of the uh, pay as you go cash funded capital projects so that we could uh, wait to see what revenues are gonna look like as we go forward to try to save some dollars. Uh, and then looking forward to next year's budget, we're projecting a, a su significant impact on the sales tax side of about uh, somewhere between 20 and 25 million dollar shortfall. Uh, so as we look forward to working on our, our budget to move forward for next year, we're having to I, you know look at different departments to determine where we can have some savings and potentially continue the hiring uh, freeze going forward into next year. Uh, on the longer term basis, uh, you know at some point, hopefully we'll have a, a uh, an answer as far as a, a vaccine for for the COVID situation sales will come back, retail sales will come back, some of that business will return, uh, but we do probably see a couple years down the road having an impact on, a negative impact on our property uh, values. Uh, several businesses are closing, some won't come back. Uh, we think that that's gonna lead to a commercial decline in commercial value uh, all over the state, not just in, in Fort Worth. So we're, we're dealing with it like everybody else is, and we're having to put some measures into place to ensure that uh, we can continue to deliver the services to to our citizens as well as maintain a good fiscal platform as we go forward. Thank you, Jay. Yes, it's very important to denote that we are gonna have impacts. So you oversee the city's economic development and public events department. Tell us a little bit about how COVID-19 shutdowns have impacted these two departments. Sure, um, 
So on the economic development side, you know, really the, the department has really had to step up and uh, react to the impacts that the smaller businesses are having in Fort Worth. Um, the federal government, as most people know, uh, did pass the CARES Act, several versions of that, and one of those was uh, provided the city some significant dollars to help deal with the impacts of the COVID situation. Um, and one of the things that the city council and, and uh, uh, you helped pass as uh, provide dollars to, um, to the, the city and the department to provide a small business uh, grant program to assist small businesses <clears throat> to hopefully allow them to get through the situation where they're not, they don't have any business coming on, uh, maybe keep some employees on, pay some bills, uh, and try to fend off the potential for them closing for good. Um, the, the program uh, was started with about $10 million. We currently uh, have about 1,800 applications that are being reviewed uh, by the department. Uh, we feel that there's gonna be at least uh, about $7 million dispersed through that first round of that program. Uh, more than likely, we'll be coming back to the city council to, uh, to recommend a second round of that program. These dollars have to be, uh, if we're gonna use them, they have to be used by the end of the year. Uh, and it's really pretty easy for the uh, small uh, Fort Worth businesses impacted. Uh, they can get a grant as long as they can provide their financials starting from January 1st through May 30th, show that the COVID situation closed them down or had a negative impact on their business. Um, and um, it is very straightforward. It is a grant. There's not, it's not big dollars. It's depending on the size of the business. It's somewhere between $5,000 and $25,000. Uh, but it goes a long way for cash flow for some of these businesses. Additionally, it has slowed down <clears throat> a little bit um, of our economic development efforts related to trying to, to draw a larger business and, and bring uh, new jobs to Fort Worth in that um, there's not a lot of travel going on. So the ability to bring, you know, we always say uh, Fort Worth to a certain extent is kind of a hidden gem in, in the whole Metroplex. If you can get somebody to Fort Worth that's never been here, they always, they always you know, look at downtown, they see what they have here, and they're like, wow, this was not what I expected of Fort Worth. Um, but getting them here is the key piece of that. So when we get in the game of trying to draw a new business to Fort Worth, uh, and they look at the area as a whole, getting them to Fort Worth is important to us. Uh, but with the restrictions on travel, a lot of folks don't want to, you know, companies aren't traveling. Uh, we're going online. We're having to do a lot of the um, meetings on Zoom and WebEx and those kind of things to, to talk to the site selection groups that, are, that we're trying to work with. Uh, but uh, business to continues, those discussions continue. Uh, it, what we're seeing is that it's a little bit of a slowdown on, on decision making on the, on the business side. Um, as far as the public events department, I mentioned uh, that department uh, being hit pretty heavily uh, on, the, on the revenue side because of the hotel tax situation. That's the tourism tax uh, funds uh, that the primarily funds that department as well as our Visit Fort Worth, our Convention and Visitors Bureau group. Um, with the situation that we're in, hotels are um, dropped from uh, Fort Worth average at about 65% occupancy across the city. Mm. Uh, it's been down to about 10%. And so that's a significant drop in revenues. Um, not only the occupancy went down, but hotels are now charging less to try to get people to come in. So it's a combination of both the rates and the, uh, the occupancy. Uh, so we've had to, in that department, actually furlough employees. Uh, we have made the decision to do that so that they could take advantage. Uh, the idea is to hopefully not let ultimately lay anybody off. They could take advantage of some of the CARES funding associated with unemployment, um, be able to collect an unemployment check, uh, while the city continues to pay their benefits. So they don't lose their benefits uh, for a period of time. Uh, ultimately, they, we were hoping that we can bring those folks back uh, onto the city's payroll as full employees. Uh, part of that is gonna be how well we can come out of the COVID situation and flatten that curve so that we can start having convention business again and having some meetings here. Um, the Will Rogers situation uh, around the equestrian shows actually is, is coming back to life uh, those groups are very diligent in making sure that they uh, hold their performances and their equestrian events uh, with some really strong uh, social distancing, wearing masks, all those kind of things. So they, that, that's coming back to life. The convention center is where we're having some difficulty getting back to, to normal. We did, 
for a period of time utilized the convention center as a uh, emergency shelter for homelessness. Um, the shelters in the homeless uh, area had to create more distance between, you know, between uh, mats and cots where folks were, would stay. So we, we couldn't, they couldn't keep all the folks that were there before. And so we had to create a uh, emergency shelter in our convention center to be able to deal with that overflow. And at, at the peak period, uh, there were almost 500 people spending the night in the convention center. Uh, we've wound that down. We have uh, found a different location. Um, the, con the shelters have come back to more normal operations. And we're going through the process now of having the, the convention center uh, cleaned and, and um, equipped to be able to handle um, regular meetings again. And that's a lot of information, Jane. Thank you for sharing it. One, th one thing that I want to uh, point out is that the city did do a very good job in designating a specific team mm -hmm. that addresses the homelessness aspect as it's impacted by COVID-19. Additionally, I do want to commend yourself and also City Manager David Cook for take making those efforts to spare our employees so they can retain their jobs, furlough only when necessary, but not let them go, not terminate their employment. Because right now, people are in very much need for their employment. Now, another budget item that helps pay for our public safety is the Crime Control and Prevention uh, District, okay? Now, this budget is very essential to providing uh, police resources. This year, residents are being asked to vote on renewing the CCPD half-cent sales tax. Chief Krause can provide details on what the CCPD pays for. Uh, so, when we get Chief Krause up here, he'll talk about that and uh, give us some insight into what CCPD does and, you know, what, you know, what it pertains to. So, okay, you know, uh, what can you tell us uh, to open up about sure. CCPD, Jay? So, I think, uh, you know, uh, a lot of folks don't realize that CCPD has been uh, with the city since the mid-90s. Uh, back, it was created at a time when Fort Worth had one of the highest crime rates in the country. Um, and the opportunity came through state law to be able to create this district. Uh, and it is specifically a half cent sales tax specific to crime control and prevention. It is not, it cannot be used for any other uh, type of activities. And so the, the, when it was passed, it's been actually uh, renewed four times. Um, the district in the past has been for five year periods. Fort Worth is the only city in the Metroplex um, or in North Texas that has a crime control prevention district that is a five year, has been a five year district. Every other city that has one of these districts either has gone to a 10 year or a 20 year term. The reason that's, ha that's occurred really when you talk to those other cities is because it allows the city to do some longer term planning. You can look out into the future, be able to work in new, um, uh, as, as, as the society changes and as new preventative uh, uh, crime options are there, you can plan for those and bring those into, uh, into play when you have that longer period of window for planning. And so this year, the recommendation was to have the city council uh, put up for vote for a 10 year versus a five year, and that's what's up to, for election this, this month. Um, it, a lot of questions have come on whether, what happens if it doesn't pass. Well, if it doesn't pass, the half cent sales tax actually disappears. Um, the sunset, of it is September 30th is when the district ceases operations. The collection of the half cent ends at the end of the, of the calendar year. Um, the reason that's there's a little difference there is because provide some funds so you can do some, the city can then go through a period of adjusting to not having those funds available. Um, the, the, what would, you know, people ask, well, what happens if, if, if it doesn't pass? Well, we would have to, uh, with the city council, uh, make some significant cuts to the overall city's budget, police department, the programs that are funded with CCPD, like the uh, after school programs, the uh, gang uh, prevention programs, the um, um, uh, any other social programs that, you know, it provides dollars to Safe Haven, for instance. Um, and then also uh, the equipment that the police department uses, the, the program uh, pays for uh, every year funds about ten million dollars for police cars replacement of police cars so high mileage police cars get replaced 
the program, the CCPD program pays for those. We'd have to find a different way to pay for those, which means you have to go into the general fund. Uh, you know, police officer is going to need a, a, a vehicle to drive around in. Uh, it's not something you can just do away, for, away with. So there'd have to be, be some significant review of the budgets. We've started doing that just in case it happens. Um, and so as we go forward, um, we're going to have to see what happens after July 14th. Um, the, the, if it does not pass, ultimately the sales tax paid in the city of Fort Worth would drop from 8.25% to 7.75%. And then plus, we also have to consider that impacts due to COVID-19, as you, you know, said before, do right. have an impact on our city budget and would affect this you know, on, a, on a larger yeah, and, scale. And the, the, the sales tax related to this uh, the fund, the CCPD fund, it has had an impact. We are estimating about a $10 million decrease in this year's fiscal year. Yeah. Uh, and next year we're looking at uh, probably being about $6 million less. Hmm. Yes, it's significant. Hmm. Well, thank you, Jay. And just a reminder for everyone that the CCPD voting takes place on July 14th. Early voting ends July 10th, so you still have an opportunity to do that. Thanks again, Jay. Thank you. Now our next guest is Fort Worth Police Chief Ed Krause. Chief Krause has been a member of the Fort Worth Police Department for over 29 years, I believe. And during the past year, he was promoted to chief and has been doing an outstanding job. Thank you for joining us, Chief. Uh, Jay and I were just talking about the CCPD program. Can you tell us about some of the things that the half cent sales tax pays for in this special district? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> last year the uh, CCPD paid for or generated approximately $78 million. Um, and those, that fund is uh, categorized into five different areas. Uh, first is equipment, technology, and infrastructure. And that's the bulk of, or the biggest percentage, about 38% of uh, the funding goes into that category. And it, it encompasses things like Jay was talking about, our high mileage vehicles. Um, replacement program. You know, when I came on, before that we had CCPD, it wasn't uncommon to get into your police car at the beginning of the shift and it had 150,000 miles on it. Okay. And that is a police car that is driven all three shifts. So I was getting into the, the car on midnights, the guy <laughs> on evening shift had, had already driven it before me and the, the female that took over for me on day shift was going to drive it for the next eight hours. So uh, those cars had a lot of miles, a lot of wear and tear on it. Um, it also included in the that uh, equipment technology and infrastructure category is equipment that that police officers use such as the uh, the in-car camera system we didn't have in-car cameras before the uh, ccpd and once we installed them we installed them in every frontline vehicle um, also the uh, the radios that every officer uses both in the cars and and the ones that we have on our person um, most people don't understand that the, uh, of all the equipment the officers carry around, their body armor, their firearm, their tasers, this is by far the most expensive thing that we carry and probably the most valuable tool that we have because when you're uh, alone on a scene, it's your lifeline uh, if you need assistance. That's a good point. Um, so the uh, next category is um, enhanced enforcement, and that's where we uh, put uh, programs such as our school resource unit, um, ever since Columbine occurred uh, back in the 90s, uh, we've had a series of school shootings in this country and um, putting those officers in school was Fort Worth's way of ensuring that we have a security presence at our, those vulnerable locations. So we partnered with uh, several school districts, Fort Worth ISD, of course, the biggest, but also Eagle Mountain, Saginaw, uh, Keller, Lake Worth, Crowley, Everman, um, to put a police officer in every middle school and high school within the city limits of Fort Worth. Um, that partnership has worked out really good. The ISDs pay half the salary and the equipment needed, including the vehicle those officers drive. So uh, it's a savings for us to be able to put the officers in there. And it also, since we're paying for half of it through CCPD, it allows the school districts to be able to afford to do that as well. Um, I, initially, that, that presence in the school was to provide that security presence. You have a marked car out front. It, somebody coming up with ill intent or evil intent to a school may think twice if they see that police car out front. And then knowing that they're going to have to encounter a, a uniformed, well-trained officer inside the school uh, is also a deterrent. But that role has kind of molded where they spend officers in the schools spend most of their time doing mentorship and counseling um, 
kind of activities with the kids. Um, a lot of people don't realize it. The SRU, the school resource unit, is probably our most diverse unit in the police department. It has a, an attraction for officers of all sorts of tenure and race and sex, and it, it, it really seems to speak to a lot of officers because you have that opportunity to directly impact the lives of youth. Um, also in that, that enhanced enforcement category is our special response teams. So we have the group of officers that are out there answering patrol cars every, or patrol calls every day. And the commanders sometimes need extra officers to address specific crime initiatives going on in their areas. And so they can call on their special response teams to address that 24 seven, any time of day or night, no matter what that crime issue is. Um, we also have, uh, included a, a SWAT component in there where we were able to add eight more officers to the SWAT unit to ensure that they have enough officers to conduct their operations safely when they need to. Um, the next group is the neighborhood crime prevention category and that is where we have some of the hallmarks of community policing in Fort Worth. Um, back in the very early 90s, Chief Wyndham started a neighborhood police officer program and he started it with just two or three officers and he said, I want you to go out there, you're not subject to call, you go out there and you fix neighborhood problems. And they kind of worked out the broken windows theory, if we can clean up an area. So if they had high weeds, they called the parks in to come mow the alleys, they called the TPW to come fix the street lights. They would see what kind of repairs could be made on people's houses that were dilapidated. And, and their job was a problem, to be the problem solver for those areas. Once C CCPD passed, we started increasing NPOs until we were able to have an NPO on every beat in the city. So we now have 89 neighborhood police officers being that community caretaker and that coordinator for that beat. Um, out there, not subject to call, but working hard every day. And um, they conduct uh, meetings with HOAs, neighborhood associations, citizens on patrol groups, and uh, you'll, they adjust their hours to whatever the problems are on that beat. Another program there is our Code Blue program, which is uh, encompasses the umbrella that encompasses all our volunteer programs. Uh, the, the biggest one and probably the most well-known is our COP program, our Citizens on Patrol. And that's where we have citizens volunteering to patrol their neighborhoods. They put a sign on their, the magnetic sign on the car. They're given one of these police radios where they can communicate suspicious activity directly to a dispatcher. They go through training before they're, they're allowed into the program and a small background check. Um, but we figure who better to know when there is something not right in a neighborhood than somebody who lives there every day. So, that program is, is fluctuated throughout the, uh, the past couple decades, as high as 850 at one point. Uh, right now we have about 500 volunteers, um, and, and that's one of the biggest programs. But we also have our Clergy and Police Alliance, which puts pastoral people in the patrol cars with the officers. So if we have a stressful situation or a, a, like a, a homicide call or something like that, while the officer is busy doing the work that is needed to be done, we have somebody there who with counseling background and experience that can minister to the families if they would like. Um, they're a very calming influence on the scene. Uh, we have Ministers Against Crime, which was also started by Chief Wyndham in the early 90s on the east side of the city, and they do much the same. They'll come out to the scenes when, when uh, they are asked to, and they are a great uh, presence for calming a community and letting officers get their work done. Uh, we have other volunteer programs in there as well. Our, our community uh, emergency response teams, uh, they're highly trained to, to help out in emergencies. So when we've had to shelter people from other areas due to hurricanes, they're able to staff the shelters, do the logistics for the food and, and get the sleeping cots and everything, all that, that maintained. And uh, they do a great job as well. The next category is recruitment and training. And so we have a, a small recruiting staff, but we allow other officers on the department to go on recruiting trips with them um, as their schedules allow. And we go out and target recruit people both in Fort Worth area and at other locations such as um, you know, military bases, historically black colleges and universities, uh, Hispanic serving institutions, trying to get more people interested in a career at Fort Worth Police Department. And then that also within that category is the training budget. So when we hire somebody into an academy class, 
their uh, salary for the eight months that they're in the training academy is paid for out of CCPD as well as the uniforms and the equipment that they use in the, in the police academy. And then the final category is called partners with a shared mission and in that category we uh, partner with different groups that, that have a crime prevention um, or address crime nexus uh, to the, the mission of their organizations and we help fund them and it, ideally we're funding them for as a startup to get them going for a couple years, two, three years and then we will move that funding to a different organization as they're able to make it on their own. And um, some other programs, we, they've been so successful, we funded throughout many years. Um, so Jay mentioned a couple of them, the, uh, the after school program, I think over the years we've put $28 million into Fort Worth after school program and they, they touch a lot of kids um, with the, the, by, you know, uh, teaching them and giving them a place to be after school and prior to the parents getting home, some of those vulnerable hours. Um, our police athletic league is along those same lines uh, where police officers serve as coaches and mentors uh, and uh, other community members serve as coaches and we teach kids the skills um, in boxing, uh, flag football, cheerleading. Um, I think we've had Frisbee golf uh, over on the east side. So. Um, that's a, a program that we started a couple years ago that is flourishing right now. Um, One Safe Place, we have a partnership with that Family Justice Center and we provide funding that helps them operate and provide services to victims of domestic abuse and other crimes. Uh, Safe Haven is another one like that where we have a, a, a relationship with the youth. And then I think Jay also mentioned the Gang Coming Up program. We've been funding that for many years. Um, so those are a lot of the programs that are that are located within CCPD that funding goes to. Yeah, and, and and really when you when you listen to how many programs are funded, you know, by CCPD, it's uh, it's really remarkable that this tool has uh, you know produced so many good benefits in our community. You know, from the SROs, the MPOs, which go so directly to uh, community policing. Uh, that's something that uh, certainly as a council member, you know, I, I've heard a lot about from constituents who want. Uh, police in their neighborhoods but as trusted members of that neighborhood. So I know that the police department has spent a lot of time and effort in ensuring public safety, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, during these times, you know, of COVID-19 uh, and also uh, with some of the protests that we've been seeing stemming from the outrage of some of these uh, incidents that have happened in our black community you know, with encounters with police officers. So, you know, I want to commend, you know, your department, first of all, uh, for being very effective in their approach to how they've maintained law and order and also uh, managed the situation. I think they've done it very respectfully. So that's a testament to your leadership, I believe. So I commend you and the professionalism of the men and women of the Fort Worth Police Department for doing that. I would like you to address uh, three issues that have come up uh, during conversations uh, pertaining to police conduct. Uh, could you tell us what de-escalation is and what it does and, you know, and, and basically how the department practices it? Okay, so de-escalation is, it's not a tactic or a technique, it is a, it, an all-encompassing uh, mindset um, that officers should use tools other than what's on their gun belt, other than force um, when they can and use force as a last result. So the, the people give us the authority to police them and tell us how they want us to police them. They look skeptically on use of force and especially use of deadly force as they should. Um, so we have to honor that trust at, whenever we can. So in 2017, we brought in uh, the PERF, which is the Police Executive Research Forum. They're a national think tank, um, and they had started de-escalation training. So we brought them in and we trained every one of our officers on de-escalation. Um, de-escalation is not necessarily a new concept. Putting this term to it is new, uh, but basically it is teaching the officers to use time and distance and objects to give them more time to consider options in a situation. So a, a classic example is you encounter somebody in mental crisis that's holding a box cutter. Um, 
instead of trying to run up there and take the box cutter away from that individual forcibly, which may create a conflict and may harm the officer, may harm the individual or a third person, if they're able to, if there's nobody else in immediate danger, we, we ask the officers to take their time, create distance, put an object between them and that individual. So if that individual was of a mind to attack the officer, he would have to go over an obstacle, gives the officer more time to react, and, and then also to take the time to bring in more resources as needed, whether it's more officers to control a, a, an area or somebody with mental crisis training that can better interact with that individual. And it's very important to note that the police department does have uh, a, a response team to deal with persons that might have some mental issues, correct? That is correct. Now that, that team has actually dwindled because of promotions of recently, but we are actually looking to expand that team. We started with six individuals, um, one for each division. We recognize that's not enough, uh, unfortunately, because of the scope of, of the issues we're dealing with here. Um, so we are expanding that unit. Um, they are currently in interview process now to get more people into that unit. And those, those individuals have all gone through uh, mental health peace officer certification, which is an extended course learning about crisis intervention training. Um, they get a certification after that. Um, and then those individuals team up with somebody from MHMR of Tarrant County. And I think we're looking to expand that to some other partner agencies as well. And, and they'll have somebody from that other agency trained in counseling, trained in the crisis intervention to ride with them. So as they encounter individuals who may be suffering mental crises, we look for a better solution on the back end. All right. Another topic that I'd like to ask you about is uh, chokeholds. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it is prohibited here uh, in the Fort Worth Police Department to use chokeholds. So can you talk about that and uh, our use of force policy? Yeah, so the, uh, the use of chokeholds is, of course, a national debate now. Several departments still authorize them. Um, many don't and haven't for a while, uh, but the George Floyd incident has certainly brought that up to national discussion. Uh, we have not allowed the use of a chokehold for many, many years, uh, well over a decade, um, maybe two. But, um, but some, off, some departments you're seeing now are moving away from that. There's national calls to make that an outlawed uh, practice in policing nationwide. Um, so we also have uh, uh, another issue. As we all watched that video, we didn't just notice that officer on George Floyd's neck. We noticed the other three officers standing around doing nothing. And it seemed like the crowd recognized what was going on and were imploring them to please intervene and they did not. Um, so now you're hearing cries for a duty to intervene policy in policing. Um, that is something we've had for several years. Um, and so we require officers when they see another officer using excessive force that they have to intervene. And we are now adding in, a, in our general order revision that not only do they have to intervene, they have to report that to a supervisor. Uh, to reinforce that, uh, with the last academy class that graduated in April, we created a new scenario that all the recruits have to go through, and it's a duty to intervene scenario, where as they go into a situation, they see another officer using excessive force on a citizen, and the only way that recruit successfully passes that scenario is to immediately intervene and stop that from occurring. Yes, and, and let me say that you know, the, the death of George Floyd more recently, in addition to the other unfortunate uh, deaths uh, from members of our black community across the nation and here locally, have, have really caused, I think, a, an introspection, you know, for us to self-examine, you know, how we do things, can we do things better? And uh, as, as a city council member, uh, I'm encouraged that from what I see across our city departments that we're committed to doing that to having you know, these frank conversations and, and, these, uh, and engaging these difficult topics. You know, things uh, happen and we have to take away lessons from this so we can learn and be better people and be better stewards you know, of, of public trust. The last topic uh, deals with community, I mean, with neighborhood policing. So can you tell us a little bit about the neighborhood patrol officers? And uh, I'd like to add something that I've heard as uh, being the council member representing uh, the largest Hispanic uh, you know, population demographic in the city. 
I've heard from members of the Hispanic community that they don't see enough police officers, you know, in, in their neighborhoods. They'd like to see a, a visible presence, but also an effective one. So if, if they're telling us that, you know, it's not enough, from your perspective, what, what can you tell us about community policing and the visibility of officers? So as far as the visibility of officers, I'll agree it's not enough. Um, ideally, we would have enough officers to put a beat officer on every beat on every shift, but we don't. And so because we don't, the commanders have to make decisions on where not to put police officers or where to put more police officers based on what crimes are occurring. Um, so. Um, yeah, you know, we had a staffing study back in 2018 and uh, Matrix Consulting Group uh, came in and said, you need 157 more officers right now to maintain your level of service that you provide. And then this much more in the next 10 years. Um, of course, we started adding that. We added 35 this past fiscal year um, and then COVID hit. And uh, Deputy City Manager Chapa already explained some of the financial impacts that's going to have. And it's going to preclude us from adding another 35, which was the, uh, the verbal agreement that we had, had gotten from the City Manager's office at 35 a year until we got up to the number we needed to be. Um, we're not going to be able to do that. So we have to be more creative with our resources and uh, and with our ideas on how to staff those beats. But the neighborhood police officer is the one who covers those gaps. So if you don't have a, a beat officer on your beat, the neighborhood police officer is out there trying to prevent crimes from happening so you don't have to have so many officers responding to crime on the back end. Um, and he does that through recruitment of citizens on patrol, crime watch groups, um, meetings with the HOAs and neighborhood associations, um, and then trying to tamp down crime through some of those broken windows theories that we were talking about earlier um, instead of being responsive to crime. I see. Thank you. I think we have two questions from uh, a resident. Uh, I think you can probably answer those pretty well, Chief. Uh, cameras were going to be placed in various places and intersections in the north side area as part of the neighborhood improvement plan. Uh, where are we with that right now? What's the status? Okay, so um, there was a problem with the contract with the group that we issue or that we purchased cameras for. So the first two neighborhood improvement zones, Stop Six and uh, Ash Crescent, we did install uh, 30 cameras for each of those areas. Uh, this year we ran into a problem with the contract. Um, I contacted purchasing today who said we should be good to go with purchasing of more cameras. Now it's a budgetary issue. Can we actually afford to do that? Money for these cameras in the north side improvement area have already been designated and set aside, so we will be able to. But since we are having that problem, what we did is we took 10 cameras that were designated for citywide camera use, and we moved those into that north side area. There were already four there, so we have 14 total right now, and we will add the other 20 that were part of that neighborhood improvement zone once the contract is, is good to go and once we have the money to do it. I see. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have uh, pertains to Rockwood baseball field parking. Uh, in that parking lot, there's been uh, recently very frequent gatherings for large numbers of people with their vehicles uh, to gather, to uh, uh, basically do burnouts, do donuts, etc. Uh, the Parks Department's been working with PD on trying to find a solution. Uh, parking markers, barriers were to be placed on the lot to deter these types of actions. Uh, so can you give us an update on where that plan is yes. right now? So, so that initiative is actually being led by the Parks Department. However, um, I can give you an update. They are in the design phase of the parking and roadway structures for Rockwood Park. I've seen a sketch of the parking lots and what it has is raised concrete islands that will be in the parking lots and that will prevent those burnouts and, and the donuts unless people just want to damage their cars because there's not going to be enough room to do that activity. Now I, uh, I believe the, uh, it goes out for bid in the fall and construction should be done by the spring. And until that time, if, if there's those issues with the gathering, especially in time of COVID, uh, contacting uh, Commander Pedro Criado will get a police response over there. We just need to know the, the times and the days if he doesn't already. Yes, and Commander Criado has been very responsive to that, and so have his officers of okay. Northwest Division. 
Thank you, Chief. I wish we had you know, more time to discuss these and other topics, <laughs> but I want to be sure that we give uh, our other guests some time to talk. Thanks again, Chief. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Likewise. Be safe out there. Our next guest is Kim Neal. Kim is the city's first police monitor. In this position, uh, it was created so that we could have a structured response uh, to citizen complaints. And this stemmed from the Race and Culture Task Force recommendations for civilian oversight of our police department. Kim will be leading the effort to finalize the model to be used for the independent review of the Fort Worth Police Department. So Kim, once again, welcome to Fort Worth. Thank you for joining us this evening. So Thank could you. you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, that way we can get to know you, and how you came to lead this new effort? Um, okay, my name is Kim Neal. I uh, became the city's po first police monitor in March of this year, so I've been here about four months. Um, I was recruited from Cincinnati, Ohio, where I was the civilian oversight director there. And I'm originally a East Coast girl from Washington, D.C., where I um, spent uh, much of my career in the compliance and ethics field in both uh, federal, state, and actually in also local governments. So I've spent a, a, pretty much a, a large extent of my career in the government sector. Yes, in fact, uh, let me say that uh, your resume is very impressive. You certainly have very good credentials, and uh, when you interviewed for this job, I and the other council members were very impressed with the hands-on application of that knowledge in the you know previous uh, uh, jobs that you had. And I think that all these things can really benefit uh, Fort Worth and the police department. So I know that a lot of people want to talk about these things with you and this important topic. So it's it has been difficult you know, to, to talk about uh, the police monitor in the you know, days of COVID-19 restrictions, but what are some of the ways your office has been able to reach out uh, to the community? Okay, so the community um, has been quite open with us in sharing with us all of their concerns um, and accolades of what's been going on. And so initially when we first started, of course we didn't have COVID-19 or at least it hadn't hit the city yet and to the extent that it's hit now. And so we were able to really reach out to community members and start meeting with them face to face. Um, and then COVID-19 hit and that uh, caused us to kind of rethink our community engagements with community groups and community members. And so we started virtual meetings that we've had consistently since March. Um, those community meetings have been quite informative in that uh, members have shared with us concerns about um, policing in the city and they've also um, shared with us accolades about policing in the city. And so um, what we've, what I have uh, discovered is that folks really just want to be a part of the whole policing and community um, problem solving process that the police department um, partakes in each day. And they really want to uh, just have their voices heard and know what's going on. Um, so one of the things that we decided to do was right now we're having these community conversations where we're asking um, at least one representative of each of a, each community group, and that includes all of our neighborhood associations, every community group that's been identified to us. And many times when we have these conversations, more groups are identified, so we could just continue to add to the list. And we're asking them a couple of questions. Uh, one is um, how they feel about community and police relations in the city. Um, we're also asking them what part they can play in improving com uh, community and police relations. And then we're also asking how would they like our office to further develop um, as it relates to civilian oversight of the police department. And so that's been quite helpful and allowed us to really create a list of ideas. Some of them are very common themes. Every group we talk to, we generally talk to about 15 groups, um, a representative from each 15 groups, um, each of the 15 groups, and we talk to them um, once a week, and we set up about three calls per week. And so we're really, um, I think, saturating the community with these questions, and we're seeing common themes across the board. So we think that by doing that, we can definitely come up with some um, excellent suggestions as it relates to improving commu community and police relations. And then the other piece of that is that we're going to do surveys. And so I'm in talks with uh, universities, local universities here, to do surveys of the communities. And I know some, some groups have said we're sick of surveys, but 
surveys are key because we really want to ensure that the community has a voice in this whole civilian oversight process. And so the surveys are going to be helpful. And um, we're also going to do a survey of police officers as well to see how they feel about community and police relations and how they think community and police can work together. And so I think it's going to be very beneficial. And through that process, we'll come up with a bunch of table topics that we'll talk about in community engagements, which we hope to do face to face. But if not, then they'll be virtual. And we hope to have those uh, do those in the next uh, two to three months. It's very encouraging to hear that there is good two-way communication between your office and, uh, and community members. I uh, also want to point out that as you establish the scope of work of your office, you do have uh, an assistant director there, Denise Rodriguez, yes. who is helping you in that regard. And she herself yes. is very familiar with uh, the legal aspects and the police aspects of uh, the police monitor job. So tell us, Absolutely. for those that may not be for, you know, thoroughly familiar with it, what does the police monitor do? So the police monitor is one of about four models of civilian oversight. Um, the model that I had in the, my prior job was an investigative model where we actually did parallel investigations to the police department. Um, our model is one which I think is probably one of the most sustainable models and I think it's a great model to, to have because we actually, instead of doing separate uh, investigations, we would actually work with the police department and monitor the police department's investigations and we would have input in, and we have had input um, in investigations just in case from a, from a community member standpoint, from a civilian standpoint, some of the things that um, we want the police department to think about, what community members would want the police department to think about as they review their investigations. Um, the model also allows for us to really take a deep dive at policies and procedures. And so the chief mentioned the use of force policy re, uh, revisions. We work with the police department on that and made some of the suggestions that he talked about. And so we've been very collaborative. Everybody's been very collaborative in that process. And that's really what it's all about. It's about um, folks like Denise and I, who are civilians, non-sworn officers working with uh, law enforcement, but speak it be, the serving as a voice for the people to make these changes to ensure that the policies that are written are ones that can be uh, viable and can be fair as they're implemented across the city. And so we've had a great time doing that. The other piece of um, monitoring involves uh, looking at um, data. And so we want to keep track of any trends, any patterns that we see so that we can then work with the police department along with um, our citizen review model to do some problem solving. And the problem solving is key because we, we, we know that the police department does a good job about problem solving, but we want the community aspect as a part of it. And so the way to do that, and I think it's the most viable way, is to um, have community members at the table, which the problem most deeply affects. And then those community members can talk with police officers and they know and then feel that they are an equitable part of the process. That then raises the cultural sensitivity of everybody involved. And at the end of the day, we're solving the problem, we're raising our cultural sensitivities, which then creates more diversity in our police department and our, in, in our serving police officers serving the community and that creates ultimately better relationships between the community and police department. And so the monitoring model, it's all about the sustainability of that. Absolutely agree with that. What are your goals for the police department and the community in as far as, you know, your wheelhouse of police monitor? So the, the ultimate goal, of course, is to improve um, uh, community and police relations, to establish new community and police relations in those communities that feel like they don't have a relationship in, and then to improve those uh, communities that feel like they have relationships and they just want improved relationships. Um, it's also to ensure that um, not just um, the, com the police department is accountable to the community, but the community is also accountable to the police department. The only way that a model works and can be sustainable as uh, civilian oversight is, is that both parties have to come together and work together. Um, it's not just about the police changing, it's also about the community changing. And so we hope to bring that to light. Um, we hope to be a, a good resource for that. Um, but the key is going to be sustainability 
what we see across the country is that a lot of cities, including Minneapolis, had a civilian review model. Um, but we still have issues, and it's because it's all about the sustainability of the model. Um, so many times cities dump a lot of money into civilian oversight, and then when everything calms down, then things change. The dynamics change. It's not as important, but it's always important because we're always going to have um, concerns, issues. People are always going to have concerns and issues, our citizens, our police department. And so we just always need to keep that dialogue going to ensure that, uh, you know, both parties are working effectively together. Yes, absolutely agree with that. And uh, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to be here with us tonight and uh, looking forward to seeing what your department, uh, you and Denise, you know, are able to do to continue to connect with all members of our community and help our processes improve and uh, help the police department's processes improve as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for having all me. Right. Now, we have another guest this evening, and that's Christina Brooks. Christina is our Chief Equity Officer for the City of Fort Worth. Uh, she leads our Diversity and Inclusion Department. Now, her job was a result, again, of a recommendation from the Race and Culture Task Force. Uh, these recommendations they made surrounded racial equity. So Christina comes to us from Fort Bend, Indiana, is that correct? South Bend. Uh, South Bend, excuse <laughs> me. And uh, she did similar work for that community. So without further ado, welcome, Christina. And uh, go ahead and tell us, uh, you know, your perspectives with all that's happening around the country in this time of COVID-19 and uh, you know nationwide protests, uh, it certainly has to be challenging for you uh, to look around and see what's happening and determine what these next steps are in terms of your you know role in in our city department. So how do you see yourself as a city's first chief equity officer uh, meeting these challenging times? So first of all, thank you so much, Councilmember Flores, for uh, inviting me to speak with uh, the residents of Fort Worth, but especially the residents of District 2. Um, the events of the past couple of uh, months have been uh, extraordinarily challenging, to say the least. Um, we see a lot of pain and frustration from communities that have felt like their voices have uh, fallen on deaf ears. And so um, part of our responsibility and what I feel our role, my specific role, but certainly our department, uh, should be to do about four different things. Um, number one, we really need to care uh, and show concern for the people that are impacted daily uh, by racial inequity whether that's through language or uh, policy or actions. Um, the second thing our responsibility is, is it involves uh, counseling um, and counseling city leadership uh, around uh, racial equity facts so that they understand um, not only what our uh, statistical data looks like here in, in Fort Worth, but also um, the uh, stories and the narratives from people um, that are impacted by racial inequity and taking that to city leadership and making sure that they have that as they uh, embark on important decisions uh, when it comes to uh, funding, uh, personnel decisions, and also uh, projects uh, throughout the city. And then uh, third, our responsibility is to educate um, not only our internal staff with the city of Fort Worth and understanding what uh, it means to have mutual respect and diversity in the workplace, um, but also um, some historical context uh, and what uh, may have transpired here, um, not just internally with the city, but also citywide and making sure that people have context uh, and understand why there are certain populations that respond uh, the way that they may. Um, it's, it's based on things that may have happened here uh, in the city of Fort Worth in the past. And so bringing that forward and making sure that everybody is educated and we're all uh, understanding what we mean when we say diversity, what we mean when we say inclusion and equity and access here uh, in Fort Worth. 
And then uh, fifth would be a, uh, making sure that there's a, a level of uh, accountability and building that into uh, the structure as we review policy and as we review programming and processes uh, here in the city that we hold uh, individuals, uh, departments, and the city as a whole and our residents responsible uh, and accountable for the actions uh, and the decisions that we make. Um, so those are really kind of the key uh, foundations of, of our department and certainly my role. And let, and let me say this, I know that, you know, ever since joining the city of Fort Worth, you have uh, really dived deep, you know, into, you know, our, our community pool, if you will, to try to learn um, more about our community and also about how our, our city government works and where we can find, again, areas that we need to look at and address further. And I also want to point out that there have been individuals and organizations that have you know, engaged the city and the city council and have uh, said that the race and culture task force didn't go far enough in their recommendations. Uh, how would you respond uh, to their concerns? Yeah, so there were so many people and organizations that were involved in that 18 month process in uh, the culmination of those 22 recommendations that were presented to City Council um, and a lot of uh, research uh, conversations um, uh, went into that uh, first iteration. And so I would say that um, this is a first step. And, um, you know, as, uh, as a city uh, in the United States, the fact that Fort Worth took the initiative to embark on that journey um, says a lot about the commitment, the level of commitment of certainly of the people in this community, uh, but also a commitment from uh, the city administration and, and officials, uh, the people that are on the ground doing the work on behalf of the residents here. And so it's a first step. Um, and it is really a responsibility of everyone uh, within the city limits uh, and, and even those that uh, may have family here um, in, in Fort Worth to come back to the table and, and remain there and remain engaged so that as we start to uh, implement the steps uh, and the recommendations, those 22 recommendations and how as they get off the ground um, and really start to work in our community that we stay engaged so that we can um, develop the next steps together and understanding what, what we need to do uh, it, to further the, the foundation that was laid by the Race and Culture Task Force. And uh, you know, I've said this before to our previous speakers, you know, uh, COVID-19 restrictions don't make it any easier for us to get out and meet with the community. We have that desire. You know, we have to make adjustments to our plan and continue to engage the community. Mm -hmm. So what are the next steps in doing that uh, from your role's perspective? Yeah, um, we, we definitely want to make sure that uh, our number one priority is the safety and well-being of our residents and certainly our staff. Uh, so we're very mindful to, to make sure that we keep that um, at front and center um, before we make any decisions about uh, pulling together uh, groups or organizations to have conversations. So most of uh, our work right now is is virtual. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, our first uh, internal uh, staff unity summit um, that really gave um, our staff with the city of Fort Worth an opportunity to share their uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions about uh, what's been happening nationwide and certainly what's happened here in Fort Worth, um, but also to bring some solutions to the table and uh, make those suggestions so that we can, um, as I stated before, move forward together. Um, we're in the process of uh, working with the police monitor's office uh, to map out a comprehensive uh, community outreach plan that will give people in the community an opportunity uh, to continue conversations across those seven key areas of the race and culture task force, criminal justice, uh, economic development, education, governance, health, housing, and transportation, 
um, over a quarter, uh, each topic will have a quarterly uh, theme and um, we'll invite people in the community to sit down and talk with us, uh, but not just have a conversation. We really want to make sure that there's um, some viable uh, information and meaningful information that comes out of that so that we can uh, incorporate that into the next iteration of recommendations um, for how to advance racial equity here in Fort Worth. So how, how do you see your department uh, working with other city departments to further that mission of diversity and inclusion? Yeah, one of the major uh, projects that we have um, underway is the city's uh, equity plan and establishing uh, an equity plan for municipal service delivery. So we've uh, mapped out uh, kind of a, a cycle, a three to five year cycle in which every department will undergo an, uh, an equity, equity review. And um, especially for, for those departments that have um, or deliver direct municipal services, uh, we wanna do a, a, a deeper dive into what that looks like, making sure that the policies and ordinances and laws that are attached to those uh, services are equitable, making sure that the language um, is equitable, but also making sure that our staff um, that are responsible for delivering that uh, municipal service are also uh, educated in how to do that uh, in a way that is, um, uh, is expected by the people here in our community. Um, and so we're in the process of, of starting that. TPW, uh, or Transportation and Public Works Department, is uh, first up. They're our pilot program, and uh, we'll start uh, the review process, the equity plan review process with, with uh, that department. Uh, and we'll review all of the, uh, the plans uh, that are associated with that department that deliver services. Uh, that impact um, capital funding, uh, and so uh, it's going to—it's—it's it's, it's a, it is an aggressive but doable uh, project, and the uh, policy guidelines that we establish uh, with Transportation and Public Works Department will be something that we can um, use in other departments uh, as we continue the review process across the other. Uh, 25 plus uh, departments in the city. Well, Christina, thank you so much, you know, for the relish at which you approach your job. I see that, you know, on a daily basis, and uh, I think it's important you know, that we pursue it, you know, with, with its needed vigor, because it is a very important. So thank you for being with us here tonight. Thank you. And then we're also very fortunate to have a recent addition, a speaker, a fire chief, uh, James Davis was able to join us and uh, much appreciation to you chief for being here I know that it's uh, very difficult the fire department and yourself have been uh, extremely busy you know with matters of COVID-19 in addition to your regular firefighting you know jobs so thank you for being here chief appreciate it. and uh, as I said you know your fire department has been involved in our COVID-19 uh, response so why don't you describe to us to our audience uh, a little bit about that you know, and then also tell us, and I'm sure everyone's curious since we just uh, finished the 4th of July, what, what magnitude of calls the fire department received for the 4th of July? Well, I'll start out with the uh, COVID response. So thanks again for, uh, for asking the question and having me here. The uh, fire department's in a unique position because we um, are kind of an all hazards agency. You know, we do fire, but we do a lot of medical and EMS. So we are able to work with uh, the community in support of MedStar as the transporting ambulance service here in the community. Um, we have paramedics on the fire department. Um, we have uh, folks that are doing everything from helping stand up and operationalize the emergency operations center where the, where the city leadership is making decisions on the day-to-day -day changes that are going on with the, with the direction of this virus and the challenges that are associated with the responding to the needs of the community. Um, but we also are able to uh, use some of our EMS resources, some of our hazardous material resources in order to um, get out into the community and help uh, try to mitigate the spread of the disease, uh, working in conjunction with the county public health department uh, and the folks there 
to identify where hot spots are in the community so we can try to uh, keep from further transmission of the disease throughout the community. So that's, that's a lot of what's going on uh, with the, the COVID-19 response. Um, and then with the fireworks on the 4th of July, you know, we, we knew that it was gonna be um, a busy weekend. We knew that there uh, was a lot of uh, folks that wanted to get out that had been, um, you know, tied up in the homes. Uh, we knew that there was some reduction in, in uh, events around the city. So we really did have an idea that it was gonna be busier than normal, but it was considerably, considerably busier than the past couple of years. Uh, we uh, stood up a, uh, a, a hotline for the folks that were concerned about noise complaints related to the fireworks and the illegal use of fireworks in the city. It's important to remember that this, you know, fireworks are illegal in the city. The idea of the fireworks hotline was to try to prevent folks from calling 911 to report these nuisance complaints and, the, and, and try to make sure that the 911 um, system did not become overwhelmed. Um, so folks that had an emergency regarding, you know, a police, fire, medical emergency were able to get through. And that worked, it worked very well. However, it received over 5,500 calls and uh, over a couple day period. And those calls created some frustration with folks um, and, you know, a lot of it had to do with um, an expectation that we were going to be able to come out, um, order um, a, a, dis, a dis stop order on the fireworks, confiscate the fireworks, maybe give a citation. And we have all those things in our arsenal. But the thing about it with, with, was with over 5,000 calls, we did not have the capacity to respond to each one of them. So what we had to do uh, between police and fire that evening is that we worked on prioritizing uh, areas where um, something happened that a firework or an illegal use of the firework created a uh, fire or an injury to a person. We responded to every one of those. Uh, we investigated those. Um, we uh, completed our assessment of that situation. We made sure the folks got proper medical attention. Um, but those became the priority during the course of that. And then anything where, you know, Chief Krause and the folks from police could talk more about you know, the actual uh, gunfire violence and stuff like that. I'm not in a position to speak about that, but we, uh, we worked together collaboratively to try to make sure that we prioritized the uh, runs or the calls that we received uh, to make sure that we responded to the ones that we felt were a higher priority. Yes, and I, I can only imagine how overwhelming that was. I mean, I, I also witnessed in my own neighborhood that there were, you know, illegal use of fireworks, fortunately. Uh, at least to my knowledge, there were no injuries, and you're absolutely correct. You have to prioritize that when it comes to public safety and injuries. Um, I want to also thank you, you know, and the fire department for being very involved and helping out, you know, our team, you know, led by Brandon Bennett and uh, Cody Whitmauer when it comes to uh, testing and, and monitoring, you know, the, the progress of COVID-19 infections in our community. Uh, as you pointed out, there are some hot spots, you know, we're, we're trying to deal with it, but you know, everyone needs to keep in mind, countywide, you know, we're seeing a at least a 50% increase in, in COVID cases. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, there were an additional 300 cases in Fort Worth and, and a, few, a little bit over that in Tarrant County today. And so the cases are, are climbing uh, at an alarming rate at this point. Yeah. And again, just drives the point home, we really do need to take it seriously. Uh, Chief, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day for being here with us. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Now, I think we've reached the end of our allotted time, but I want to thank everyone, all our speakers, for being here this evening, joining me and answering questions from, from our constituents. And uh, any questions that we didn't get to, go ahead and send them in. Uh, we'll answer them as best we can. Uh, they'll be posted on our Facebook page, and we will also have a link to tonight's broadcast so that you can share with anyone who couldn't join us this evening. In closing, I want to encourage everyone to complete their 2020 census form if you haven't done it already. It doesn't take more than 10 minutes of your time and it's very valuable. Keep in mind, the information is confidential and it helps to determine how federal and state funds are spent and will also be used to create two new city council districts before the 2023 election. And that's very important when it comes to representation here at the local level. So it's important that we all be counted in our community. Many of the programs that we spoke about earlier today were provided uh, by having that census data to respond to COVID-19. So let's count everyone, you know, for our school's sake, 
social services program sake, hospitals and city services sake. So for me, you know, I would like to invite you that you can always contact my office at 817-392-8802 or email me at our office at district2 at fortworthtexas.gov. So remember Fort Worth, take it from this council member and all our fellow council members and the mayor. Please stay safe, wear your masks, and thanks again for joining us tonight. Y'all have a good night.